My name's Christine Mummery and I work at Leiden University Medical Centre where I'm head of the Department of Anatomy and Embryology. In my bi uh, physics classes, uh, about a third of us were women. So that was for me, yeah, quite normal uh, in the UK. And I moved to the Netherlands and I was the only woman postdoc. I was the only woman in the group. Uh, apart from technicians who were all female. So I came in as a postdoc and kind of felt a bit odd as the only academic. And then I began to realize that although the Netherlands seemed quite an emancipated country, actually they'd had a law which banned married women from working from 1949 to 1964. So that meant that all women who might have worked all had mothers who were at home. So, oh, this is a really strange a difference in societies was in, in England, the men died in the war or something like that. So women were very used to working. So it was quite a different culture. I felt kind of one of the boys. They didn't really treat me any differently from being a woman. But I did notice that um, it became quite hard to become visible. So, uh, you know, if, even though I had an extremely emancipated boss, the, his boss, if it became, okay, we're going to send somebody to a meeting, it would be the guys that would be sent. So it, it felt a little bit uh, as though you were overlooked. I thought, hmm, I'm going to have to do something about this. Um, but luckily, uh, various kinds of things happened, um, circumstantial, but I, uh, by default, became the spokesperson on work with human embryos when the first human embryonic stem cells were derived. And that was by default in many ways because my direct boss, who was very emancipated, uh, had a car accident and had a whiplash injury, so it's quite a personal kind of story for him. Uh, and I was the only person who knew enough about embryos and embryonic stem cells to actually be the spokesperson. So I was kind of uh, catapulted to the front line without much experience and um, it really took off from there. And actually I had very few female colleagues. Uh, it was, um, so I worked in the department uh, of uh, developmental biology. So there were some classical embryologists, but they were, uh, I, it's not very nice to say it, but they were aging spinsters. <laughs> so, uh, and that's, they dedicated their lives to doing this. So, em developmental biology was dominated by women, but the signal transduction world was highly male dominated, and I was in a signal transduction group. So, I really didn't have many female colleagues. And the, because of this law in the Netherlands, women actually didn't, didn't work at all when they had children. So, I have three children. And I thought, you know, how are we going to, to fix this? So my English friends, who were all, all had careers, said, what are you going to do, um, get an au pair or you go to a daycare? And my Dutch friends said, are you going to uh, stop or work part time? So I thought, whoa. So I actually was more efficient working full time, not full time in the sense a scientist does, like 16 hours a day. I did a nine till five. Um, but I couldn't say that it's socially in the Netherlands, so I, I just sort of um, didn't say I worked five days a week and tried to fit the agenda around it. But had a lot of support from my partner, my husband, so uh, we managed fine. Um, but it did mean being super organised and not actually saying you were working full time. I've noticed and there was actually a study about it, that women peak in their career about 10 years later than men. Um, and you, you know, a 40-year-old man, you should really compare with a 50-year-old woman. And it sounds really uh, ridiculous, but you do lose some years, even, even if you're very well organised. And um, it, is, it is a disadvantage because many grants, for example, or prizes, whatever, they are sort of so many years out from your PhD. So most women will be further out from their PhD and by definition ineligible. And that's always seemed to me very unfair. And I think we should perhaps find other benchmarks for doing this. Um, they now in grant applications, for example, give you one extra year leeway for pregnancy or something. But of course, you know, just having a pregnancy is a greater impact on your life 
uh, than just you know the pregnancy itself and um, there's the other, even women who don't have children there's a certain delay in developing the confidence um, to go out there <clears throat> and <clears throat> I wouldn't say compete but to actually have the self-confidence to say I can do this and you and we see in, in organizing committees program committees a lot of women's decline invitations so you talk to almost anybody who says we have to invite almost twice as many women uh, as men to get 50% accepting. And it's the same with uh, grant panels, uh, many things. Uh, women end underestimate themselves. So as, now as a group leader, most of my time I spend men mentoring women to get them to have the self-confidence uh, to go out there and go and get their grants at interviews uh, and the like. So, I mean, I was very, very very shy I would turn bright red and get sleepless nights when if I had to give a talk somewhere and I try to help people avoid that um, that sort of dilemma or delay in career development my male colleagues would often be first author um, and I would be second even though we'd done the, the work equally and um, with one particular group uh, I did publish a lot of papers on a particular subject and we had seven uh, joint papers and none of them I'm last author. Um, and so I hope, you know, having the label stem cells on my forehead uh, helped people say, oh, she did the stem cell component of that paper. But um, I never felt comfortable saying, I think I should be last author. I felt very uncomfortable. So I, didn't, I avoided those conversations, avoided the conflict they might give rise to. And I've also thought about how you could deal with it. So I try to treat my trainees, or try to teach them, how you can have that conversation without it feeling like a conflict. It's very hard, um, but it's very important. Otherwise, women just don't get visible. It's been really important for me because the mixture of different cultures means that there's a high representation of women here and it's been an, on the agenda right at the outset. So it's one of the few places I've actually felt very confident as a woman um, because there are, you know, there are great women scientists, Elaine Fuchs, Fiona Watt, all these, Sally Temple, Connie Eve, all these people have been icons uh, for the field and I don't come across them in daily life so it's been great. And secondly, um, you know, given that I've, you know, I was on the board, I've been on the board, I've been the editor in chief of the journal, I will become at some point president. That's actually given me a lot of self-confidence and uh, a lot of respect in Europe because they think, oh, she's really involved in that society, and uh, so I'm sort of seen as a, a sort of a kind of extra special stem cell expert because of the uh, involvement with ISSCR. And I'm kind of very proud of the organisation um, because they've allowed me to become part of it without any, any difference at all for being a woman. So that's been really good.